It's a very busy weekend. It is referred to as Memorial Day weekend. But a brief history tells us that Memorial Day is an American holiday observed on the last Monday of May. Only the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. Originally, this day was known as Decoration Day. It originated in the many in the years following the Civil War and became an official federal holiday in 1971. Many Americans observe Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries or memorials, and if you look around in our cemetery, you will see that those who have connections with that, their gravestones are already decorated. It is also a time when people hold gatherings and participate in parades celebrating this day. Unofficially, it marks for the common good of humanity, especially Americans. We pray that their souls will rest in peace and God's eternal light will shine upon them. But today also is Pentecost Sunday, or Whit Sunday, as I grew up knowing this day. And white was born in the culture in which I grew up. Everybody wore white, a symbol of purity, possibly. And it is known by many other names, as we shall see in my presentation or reflection this morning. John Butterford, the, one of the contributors to our daily bread, describes Pentecost in the light of a summary statement that I want to present to us this morning to understand possibly a common usage of the word and possibly to understand a little deeper into what is mentioned. Pentecost is mentioned in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 as though we are gathered together in one place. Well, it was always celebrated 50 days after the first Sunday following the Passover. It served as a centerpiece of Jewish worship and occurred during the festival of weeks, according to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 to 21. Elsewhere, it is referred to the festival of harvest in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, and it is also referred to as the days of fruits, of first fruits, in Numbers chapter 28, verse 26. The Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 occurred on the 50th day after the resurrection of Jesus. It's significant that the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles on this day of Pentecost. They were the first fruits of the new covenant God was implementing through his son. Jesus, his son Jesus Christ, according to what you will read in Romans chapter 8 verse 23. Pentecost is a prime example of how the Old Testament points to Jesus and his works in our behalf on the cross. We are, the church is the first fruit. Pentecost was the first fruit harvest of God in its new dimension. As I prepared this reflection, a question came to mind that I feel can help us in our understanding of the Holy Spirit. The question that came to my mind is, what is the difference between our conscience and the Holy Spirit? What is the difference between our conscience and the Holy Spirit? Every human being is blessed with the conscience. Amen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we confuse the two. But let me give you a definition I find that I feel is succinct for this moment. The conscience is an inner human faculty corrupted by sin and the fall. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, is the divine agent God uses to begin his redemptive work in believers. So one is by how we feel. And if you agree with me, the majority of church decisions today are made based on how people feel the popular concept rather than by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. From Acts chapter 24 verse 16, conscience gives us the ability to evaluate our own thoughts and our own desires 
to discern what is right for me or what is wrong and to distinguish between what is good because and best according to the minds of men. Now, so this morning I'm going to teach you so it is reality. It is there are many misconceptions about the identity of the Holy Spirit. Some view the Holy Spirit as a mystical force. Others see the Holy Spirit as an impersonal power that God makes available to followers of Christ. But what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? Because sometimes we want to define things based on our conscience, based on what we hear educated men and women put out there, but we do not consult the manual for our lives. And that's why we are in error. So what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? I'm sure you want to hear a few points the Bible mentions about the Holy Spirit. Simply put, the Bible declares the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is God. The Bible also tells us that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. A being with a mind, emotions, and a will. His omnipotence, his omnipresence is seen in Psalm 139, verse 7, where, and, he quote, and I quote, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, we read these words. We see the character of the omniscience of God, the Holy Spirit. There are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. These are the things in, in, in Spirit, or the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God. Don't ask me to explain it because if you take your, feel like your mind that is clouded by sin to understand that and to define it and put it into a test tube, you will fail. But possibly that's not too difficult to understand once I move to the second aspect of who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is a person. Amen? Amen. Being a person, the Holy Spirit has feelings. He can become sad or angry, and others can insult him and blaspheme against him. Yet, if we look at scripture from Isaiah chapter 63 verse 10, it says, Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. And if we look at Matthew chapter 12 verse 31, he says, When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes from the Father, He will testify about me. In Acts chapter 13, we read, verse 2, we read these words. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barabbas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. I can go on and on in Scripture to tell you who the Holy Spirit is. But it may be redundant. But and also, I want to spend some time on Wednesday to talk more about who the Holy Spirit is. But how does it work? I'm so glad you asked. It's a good question. How does the Holy Spirit work? For this, I refer to one of my spiritual leaders who, in my early commitment and con conversion into a deep faith in Christ, Dr. Billy Graham was one of those. As many of you know, I lived in Africa and I studied in Africa and much of my resources were books written by renowned men and women of God. Movies we watched that began to disciple us and to give us an impact of our faith. So I referred to Dr. Billy Graham to see what he says about 
Who is, or what does the Holy Spirit, or how does the Holy Spirit work? Number one, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Listen to what he says. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, verse 8. He uses a mother's prayer or a tragic experience or a pastor's sermon or some other experience to convict us of sin and our own need to give our lives to Jesus Christ. He points us and says, you are a sinner. You need to repent. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no conviction. It's only a sweet feeling. Sometimes sad feeling. We feel sorry. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we confess and we receive the provision that God has made through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't like to hear the word sin, and so sometimes we call it by different names. Because sometimes, because we are guilty, we minimize the power of God and submit ourselves under the dictates of the spirit of the devil rather than embracing the spirit of God and coming alive. Second, the Holy Spirit gives new life. Hallelujah. The Bible says that we are dead in our sins, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Our spirit within us is made in the image of God. It was dead when Adam and Eve sinned. Mankind needs life. That is why Jesus, when he comes, if you listen to part of the gospel for last week, this is eternal life that you know him. The true God and Jesus whom he has sent. This is eternal life. And when I finished preaching last week, God gave me a revelation to the truth about that. And let me explain the revelation he gave me. This is eternal life. Eternal life is received once we believe in God that Jesus sent Jesus to be the Savior of the world. But everlasting life continues once we have the experience of eternal life. Do I make sense? Eternal life is the gift given. Everlasting life is the life we begin to live now into the world and the life beyond. Amen? Amen. So once we receive the gift of God, that Jesus is the Savior of the world, we are empowered to live not just now, but to live an everlasting life. So he got, he he is the one who gives us new life. But the third thing I want to mention this morning, the Holy Spirit lives in us. Hallelujah. Lives in us. As you hear this, you may realize that you are, you may be spiritually dead. But God says, I will put my spirit in you. I will come to live in you. I am with you now, but I will live in you before Jesus left what he said. That's the reason we should never take anything unclean. We must set ourselves apart because when Christ comes to live in us in the power of the Holy Spirit, we receive new life and we have new desires. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is past and gone and behold, all things have become new. God brings transformation into our lives, not because of our effort. We are born by God's Spirit. And God does the act, and God in us begins to create a new desire and a new life and a new way of living. We cannot change our positions in our circumstances and feel we can become holy. The Holy Spirit makes us holy. Amen? Amen. And the way we can know the truth about the Holy Spirit is through the Word of God. And I want to finish with this last function of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit gives power to serve Christ. There are many academ academicians in the world who read the Bible and it's only a head knowledge. To read the Bible without the power of the Holy Spirit is a storybook. But to read the Bible with the power of the Holy Spirit is a living word. Amen? Amen. Because that Holy Word will transform will first of all convict us that what we are doing is wrong. We would have acknowledged it and we will turn around. Today's church is plagued by intellectual, um, uh, intellectual 
power. We go to all the professors, we go to all the books they are written, we go to all of that. Our churches will remain powerless without the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, God poured His Spirit upon all flesh, like Joel had promised. And Peter preached with authority and power of the Holy Spirit. And many lives were blessed. Today our church is also claimed not by the intellectualism of others, but also by a common conviction to be accepted. And so we forget about God. We want to live by our consciences. God calls us. As I prepared this, God spoke to me and said, yes, TOS is wonderful, but TOS is the only big principles and things that we have developed. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, God's church is dead. And God's church cannot match on because the church of God can only match forward under the authority and the power of God's Holy Spirit. I present to you this morning this one who comes to us to bring us new life and new power. Without a life full of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to build up the body of Christ. A gospel with no emphasis on the Holy Spirit is flat and baseless. In certain moments when there was a special manifestation of God in the New Testament emphatically states that the partakers were filled with the Holy Spirit. This was the experience of many. John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, the Bible tells us, full of the Spirit in his mother's womb, according to Luke chapter 1 verse 15. Elizabeth, when Mary greeted her in Luke chapter 1 verse 41, and Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, when he prophesied in, one, in Luke chapter 1, verse 67, but Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, was led by the same Spirit into the desert. The disciples were filled with the Spirit in the upper room, and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, stood up and preached on the day of Pentecost, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 14. The young Stephen, full of the Spirit, saw the glory of God when he was stoned to death. And Paul, inspired by the Spirit, rebuked the sorcerer. There is no doubt that in the church, a life filled with the Holy Spirit, there is no doubt that in the church, a life filled with the Holy Spirit should be mourned, should not be mourned, should be the norm, sorry. A church filled with the Holy Spirit must be the norm of the church. The filling of the Holy Spirit was even a requirement for serving in the church, even to serve food. Without a life full of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to build up the body of Christ. And we end up limiting God's word to our consciences and our faith. When Collier writing on Pentecost in the devotion I read this morning, I had to include this and to quote it for us. It says, during the discussion of a book on the Holy Spirit written by a 94-year-old German theologian named Jürgen Moltmann, an interview asked him, how do you activate the Holy Spirit? Can you take a pill? Do the pharmaceutical companies deliver the Spirit? Moltmann's Bushy eyebrows shut up. Shaking his head, he groaned. Answering in accent in, in an accented English. What can I do? Don't do anything. Wait on the spirit, and the spirit will come. Most man highlighted our mistaken belief that our energy and expertise make things happen. Acts of the Apostles reveal, reveals that God makes things happen. At the start of the church, it had nothing to do with human strategy or impressive leadership or tactics. Next, rather, the Spirit, the spirit shattered all ethnic
they was created. Jesus who died so that we may be reconciled with God, make us reconcilers within the community of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, who inspires us into new ways of life, fall afresh upon us through his power. And now may the blessing of our Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us wherever we be, we may be at this time now and forever. Amen. Amen. Good. Okay. 